and I will start to let them in. You guys want to um, Here we go. watch this? Really like the cover slide, title slide. Not necessarily what you want to see, but a, a dramatic image. <laughs> Folks are coming in. Looks like we've had uh, some more folks still coming in. We're up to 33 now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a glass of water before we start. <laughs> okay. At 7 p.m. it looks like. John, you want to kick us off? Okay, yes. I have a, just a brief technical comment for people that have joined us for this uh, Zoom uh, presentation. We're going to be, Jay's going to be sharing his screen. And so you probably see a panel of four if you're on a computer anyway, you see maybe four uh, participants in a panel on the right. You can change that display and a better display to use if you move your mouse over into that area where you see the images of participants and you pick the rectangle at the top um, border of that. It says show small active speaker video. If you pick that, uh, you will see only the um, speaker the active speaker and that way you'll have see have more of the screen available for seeing the slideshow. Um, so with that I'll turn it over to Virginia to introduce our speaker and welcome us. Thank you John. Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm Virginia Tippy, um, the chair and co-chair with uh, John Butler for the uh, Environmental Committee and of course uh, we're really pleased to have you join us tonight for our very special holiday presentation. You know, Jay Fleming is phenomenal. And many of you actually had an opportunity to meet Jay at our holiday presentation a few years ago. And obviously, as you saw then, his work was phen is phenomenal and continues to be. And we're so very fortunate to have him back with us for this holiday uh, event. And what you may not know about Jay is, you know, he discovered his passion of photography, uh, you know, upon inheriting uh, uh, from his father, the former, a former National Geographic photographer, Kevin Fleming, who was phenomenal as well. <laughs> his dad handed him a, a Nikon, obviously, film camera at the age of 13, and he was addicted. He immediately started to look through life through the lenses of a camera. And 
in, what ensued was really a very exciting photographic journey for Jay and for all of us that shared it with him. Uh, the, what was happening around the world and especially in the Chesapeake Bay. And he became obviously a professional photographer and for the last 20 years, he has been doing phenomenal work and literally has an extensive portfolio that is really very impressive. I know that Jay's first book, I've got to show it because I have a signed copy, by the way. Look at this, Working the Water. And this was actually my Christmas present to my significant other who works the water. And what a great way to kick off uh, an understanding of the bay, then telling the story of the people in the bay. And this, by the way, is now in its third printing, but he's about to come out with a second book. And that's what we're gonna hear about tonight. And his second book is Island Life. And it is expected to be released in 2021, um, in probably the fall, given everything going on. <laughs> right, Jay? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, but uh, it, we're excited about it and can't wait to see it. And we get to get a preview. And so tonight he will be actually presenting his, the work that he has done on the Chesapeake Bay Islands, both Tangier and, of course, Smith Island. And we are just thrilled to have with you us you with us tonight Jay and we really want to say welcome and thank you for joining us I'll turn it over to you excellent thank you Virginia I'm going to stop screen sharing so everybody can see me real quick everybody there I'm actually not on Tangier Island I'm in my uh, spare bedroom at my house and the background that you see is uh the harbor at Tangier where many of you may have been before it's uh Tangier is a, a great place to stop if you're cruising on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, has a deep water, a lot of deep water access, and um, it's a, a really unique environment. So tonight, I'm going to be presenting my work that came after my first book, Working the Water, um, that focused on Smith and Tangier. So I took a chapter of Working the Water, and if you've seen my book, you'll, you'll know that there's a chapter within there called Island Life. And um, it kind of, it, it does a shallow dive into the communities on Smith and Tangier, showing how the people make a living on the water, showing some aspects of the communities that are unique and that have been shaped by the isolation, uh, you know, not being accessible by car, ex essentially. They're only accessible by boat and by a plane. So um, the, the work that I did on Tangier and Smith and work in the water was only scratching the surface. And after the publication of Work in the Water, I started to spend more and more time on Tangier and Smith. And it was only a natural transition for me to start working on this book on Smith and Tangier. So I'm going to start screen sharing with you. And I'm going to share with you a preview of Island Life. And the presentation is going to follow the flow of how I've organized the book. So bear with me here. Excellent. Can everybody see that? Very good. So Island Life, a photographic narrative of life on the Chesapeake's only inhabited offshore islands, Smith and Tangier. So what makes life on these islands unique? How are the communities unique? And how have they been shaped by the isolation and by the Chesapeake Bay? So I first was attracted to Smith and Tangier by the wildlife. These islands are incredible places for wildlife. I mean, you've got such incredible habitat. The marshes there are very secluded and very remote and provide a ton of habitat for nesting birds. And my first trip to Smith and Tangier was to photograph the nesting pelicans. Um, they're actually on the lower end of Smith into the Virginia portion, um, Smith Islands in both Maryland and Virginia. And um, the birds are nesting on a spot called Shanks Island. So Smith Island is actually what I would call an archipelago of islands. It's, it's made up of hundreds of different pieces of marsh and sandbars and stuff like that. So it's not just one island, it's many different islands. So Shanks is a small portion um, on the Southern end 
that's pretty pretty much washing away. I mean, Shanks is all but disappeared, and the pelicans are nesting on a small piece of high ground on Shanks. So the first time I went to Smith in 2009, I didn't have a boat. I didn't really have access to people on the island, um, you know, a place to stay, so on and so forth. So I took my kayak over on the ferry. And I packed my kayak with my camera gear, um, camping gear, water, food, etc., and paddled down to Shanks, and actually camped out with the pelicans down there. So that was that was a pretty unique experience. And as I kind of became more interested in the islands, I explored more and more um, of the different areas in Tangier Sound, including Holland Island, which is a formerly inhabited island um, that many of you have probably heard about. This was the last house on Holland Island that I photographed on a camping trip to the island in 2010. So Holland Island was an island like Smith and Tangier at one point, had a, a thriving community in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. There were somewhere around 70 homes, 350 plus people living on the island, uh, church, a school, stores, et cetera, and so forth. They had a, it was a, it was a full on community. And um, as the island began to wash away, uh, well, it was always washing away, but it began to wash away to a point where people were really noticing it. And the people who lived on the island um, realized that they needed to do something. So the residents started dismantling their homes, putting them on barges, moving them to adjacent towns on the mainland, such as Crisfield, um, Crozier in Maryland, um, somewhere up in Cambridge, actually. But, um, you know, the Holland Islanders, they saw what was going on with the landscape. They saw it washing away and they realized that they needed to do something. So in a way, exploring these old islands of the past kind of represented an element of foreshadowing for potentially Smith and Tangier. And you'll see later in my presentation, there were many other islands that were formerly inhabited that I would call offshore islands. So islands that weren't accessible by anything but a boat. So I, I explored more and more on Tangier. And, you know, early in my photography career, I was primarily focused on wildlife. So I explored the underwater habitats of these islands. Um, these islands, in addition to having great habitat in the marshes for wildlife, they have incredible lush grass beds in the shallows adjacent to the shorelines, uh, where you'll find blue crabs, rockfish, seahorses, um, on the oyster bars, you'll find these small creatures such as blennies and all kinds of different, different little fish that live within the oyster reefs. Here's a short video that I shot this spring. Um, when, when the shutdowns first started and COVID was first going on, I, uh, I rented a house and actually lived down on the island. So I spent quite a bit of time down there. And spring was the best time to, to photograph the wildlife underwater. Uh, being that the water is, is cold and the, the summer algae hasn't bloomed yet. So I spent quite a, quite a bit of time this spring um, doing underwater photography. So in addition to the underwater photography, there's some, or excuse me, the wildlife, there's some terrestrial wildlife such as foxes that live on some of the northern islands, um, South Marsh Island, Adams Island. And these foxes um, were thought to have gotten out there during a freeze up when the bay froze over. So the, the foxes probably, you know, wandered on the ice down south from like Hooper's Island or some other areas in Dorchester County and got essentially stuck on the islands. But as you can see, there's an abundance of food on these islands, especially when the birds are nesting in the um, spring of the year. Check your email for a Zoom link going on right now. So. Moving back to Smith and Tangier, um, you know, with the book, I'm providing a broad picture of the entire landscape. So in order to, to accomplish that, I've spent quite a bit of time up, up in the air because really being up in the air is the best way to capture the landscape of this flat island. Um, both Tangier and Smith Island have very flat landscapes where the highest point of land may be three or four feet above sea level. So having the ability to get up into the air 
is an incredible tool for documenting the landscape and also documenting the change in the landscape. So this is a photograph of Tangier from the northern end. And the northern end of the island is called Upwards. And if, if any of you have read the book Chesapeake Requiem by Earl Swift, um, you'll know that the book starts off by talking about Upwards and it talks about um, a woman walking over a cemetery on Upwards. And this is that cemetery. So Upwards is eroding at an alarming rate, um, upwards of 20 feet a year if the weather's right. So upwards being exposed on the northern northern end, um, it, it gets the brunt of the winds off the Chesapeake Bay. So, um, you know, you get a, a northwest wind, which is predominant in the winter, and the shoreline on upwards will get just beaten and beaten constantly. So that takes off chunks and chunks of land. So you'll see this cemetery here um, that was exposed after Hurricane Sandy. And, um, you know, the cemetery has since washed away, but I, I took this photograph immediately following Hurricane Sandy. So the problem with the erosion extends to the whole island, essentially, unless the island's protected with a seawall. So there are a lot of calls for a seawall, and Tangier just recently got a small jetty, which is kind of like a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, so to speak, um, to protect the harbor from wave action and to protect part of the shoreline from erosion. But essentially what really needs to be done for both Smith and Tangier, if they're gonna exist long into the future, is to have a seawall going around the whole island. And if you've ever been to Tangier, you've probably seen the seawall that extends uh, from the entrance to the channel on the southern end down past the airport. And that was built, I think, in the, I believe, 70s. So that whole section of the island hasn't suffered from any erosion due to that hard shoreline. I think I'll show you the last image. You can kind of see in the top right corner of the frame the jetty that was just built. And then past that is the, the seawall that protects the airport area. But really you get a sense from this aerial, aerial of how incredibly vulnerable Tangier is. And um, you know, on a, on a high tide, a large portion of the island can be underwater. And you'll see this is a photograph of high tide um, flooding the streets. This was during a hurricane. So to document these high tide events and to show you know, what these residents have to deal with during extreme weather, I had to go out there in extreme weather. And so I've, I've spent uh, multiple hurricanes out there for the past two years. Fortunately, we haven't had any bad hurricanes on the bay recently, but, you know, I did take the opportunity to go out there um, in an effort to document these tidal events. And then, you know, on occasion, you'll just get a, get a regular tide event that's um, super high and you'll get you'll get water in the streets. Some people got water in their homes last October when we had that high tide in mid-October. So as you can see, living on an island that's you know incredibly um, low, low lying is very difficult and the residents have to put up with quite a bit of stuff there just on a regular basis. As you can imagine, their golf carts and vehicles don't last very long with this salt water. So I've also spent quite a bit of time documenting, um, you know, the infrastructure on the island and, you know, capturing images that show, you know, how difficult it is to get just everyday things that we take for granted on the mainland done. So this is a, a photograph uh, showing a tree trimming truck that the electric company on Tangier brought out to uh, trim trees to protect their power lines. So something that, that, you know, is relatively simple on the mainland that would take, you know, half of a day would take maybe two or three days out on Tangier Island or Smith Island. So I've also spent quite a bit of time building relationships with the Islanders and, you know, I've gotten to the point where, you know, the Islanders will welcome me in their homes and, you know, allow me to photograph things like them cooking traditional dishes, um, birthday parties, so on and so forth. So events that show 
the community of the island and, and you know the unique community that these people have created and the bonds that they've created with each other being you know so isolated and so uh so tight-knit so this is a photograph of a woman named janice marshall and she's cooking a traditional um, smith island crab dish called stewed jimmies and stewed jimmies is a is a unique dish to smith island um, the crabs are actually steamed in like a, a gravy so to speak like a crab gravy really kind of delicious and yes after after photographing it i did get to taste test and of course the iconic smith island cake is the eight to ten layer cake um, that was recently put on the map um, after the state of maryland designated it the state dessert i believe in 2008 so the smith islanders have uh have found a way to capitalize on this not only through tourism, like bringing people out and doing like cooking demos, that type of thing, but there are actually people on the island who ship cakes all over the country. And um, this fall, I actually got to photograph a lady who's kind of dubbed the, the Smith Island Cake Lady. Her name's Marietta Marshall. And she was packing um, orders for cakes that she was shipping out to California. So kind of funny that, you know, something from that little island could actually get out that far. It's pretty amazing that, you know, they figured out a way to make a living doing that. Photographing community events as well. I've, I've photographed a couple events on, on Smith Island, including the 4th of July parade that you see here. This is the, the parade in Tylerton, which is one of the three villages on the island. And um, on Tangier, I've photographed the um, Halloween activities and also the Memorial Day events. So I'm still kind of putting the putting the book together and, and going through the images and picking out which ones might fit best into the book. And uh, that that is the most challenging part of this entire project is actually calling down the images. Um, I think in my last presentation, I probably mentioned to you that I took over 300,000 pictures for working the water. And I think at this point, after working on Island Life since 2009, I think I'm, I'm well over 500,000 pictures for this book. So this winter, being quarantined and being stuck inside might be a good time for me to call through those 500,000 pictures. This is a photograph of Matthew Parks um, for the education chapter of the book. Matthew was the only student to graduate from Tangier Combined School this year. And it's the first time in the history of Tangier Combined School that they've only had one graduate. So that's a testament to the fact that the population of these islands is shrinking. Um, Smith Island has a population of only, or excuse me, the, the school population of only five kids. At one point in time, there were about 50 to 60 kids in the Smith Island School. So Matthew, like I said, was the only student to graduate this year from Tangier Combined. Religion is a very important part of the communities. Um, they're predominantly Methodist. Um, this is the pastor, Everett Landon. Um, he serves all three communities on Smith Island, um, Yule, Reds Point, and Tylerton. So Tylerton being an isolated community, um, on Sundays when Everett is preaching in Tylerton around 11 o'clock, he's got to take a take a boat over to Tylerton from Rose Point. So this is a photograph of Everett in the skiff um, run by a man named Ronnie Corbin, who does the same thing for him every Sunday. And um, he's wearing his white boots because the tides were high that day and he had to walk through water in order to get to church. This is a photograph of the tabernacle that is used for the annual camp meeting ceremony. Um, camp meeting is like a uh, religious revival. It's a retreat for one week where um, Islanders will kind of renew their faith and um, they will gather pretty much seven days during the week at the tabernacle. And it's a really cool kind of classic old structure that was built, I think in the 1940s, um, sawdust floors, wooden pews. It was really neat. And I was, I was very lucky that I was able to be part of that part of that event for um, my book, because it's such an important part of, uh, 
of the island communities. People, people who have moved off the islands will come back and they'll take part in the camp meetings. So you get to really see a lot of people in, you know, really see how strong these, the faith of these people is. The blessing of the fleet ceremony is a ceremony that happens on both Smith and Tangier every year. Um, this is a photograph of Richard Pruitt on Tangier. He's throwing the uh, ceremony, ceremonial wreath into the water. And as you can see, the, the folks are in the background are watching. But, um, you know, the Tangier Islanders and Smith Islanders have an incredibly strong connection to the water. They spend a great deal of time on the water. And obviously with with that comes great risk. And the purpose of the blessing of the fleet ceremony is to, you know, to, to wish the best for a safe and prosperous season on the water, not only for the watermen who are harvesting seafood, but for the ferry captains who bring people to and from the islands on a regular basis. Um, and just for anybody on the islands who spends time on the water. Um, Tangier has had, has quite a few people who have perished on the water and most recently in 2017, a crabber named um, Ed Charnock passed on the water. Um, his boat went down, him and his son, his son survived, but um, I've shown this picture actually to his son and his son told me that that's exactly what he saw when their boat was sinking. This is a photograph of a, a work boat that was sunk off of Smith Island um, in 2018. Um, didn't have anybody on it. Nobody was hurt during the sinking, but it was just being disposed of. But kind of an iconic image to um, how powerful the water truly is. So obviously being completely surrounded by water, most of the people on the islands make a living on the water. And the, the season really kicks off for crabbing in May when the peeler crabs start running. And the first group of people, group of watermen to put their gear out are the peeler potters. And the peeler potters are targeting crabs that are shedding in the shallow grass beds. And um, they're catching them in pots that you see on the back of this boat, Miss Michaela. This is a crab scraper and crab scraping is one of the more iconic fisheries to the island. Um, crab scrapers drag a toothless dredge essentially, kind of similar to what people catch oysters with but they drag them through the grass beds and it kind of goes over top of the grass and picks up the, the soft crabs and the peeler crabs that are hiding into the grass. And the reason why so many watermen on Smith Island uh, crab scrape in Tangier as well is because there's an abundance of underwater grass in the shallows around the islands. So the watermen will catch the crabs in the grass beds. They'll bring them back to their shanties um, they call them shanties, they're essentially crab houses, and they'll shed the crabs out. And from that point after they've shed the crabs out to you know what you might see in a retail store, they'll ship them out to Crisfield, um, where they'll be distributed all over the country. Actually, funny enough, I sold some pictures to a company in California, a seafood company in California that was buying soft crabs from Smith Island and Tangier. So these soft crabs have a wide-reaching market. Um, a lot of Tangier men and Smith Islanders will actually ship their crabs directly to New York to Fulton Fish Market. So, you know, seafood from these little islands has a, has a huge reach. Um, the Tangier Sound region of the Chesapeake Bay produces more soft crabs than anywhere else in the world. And moving on into the fall and winter, um, oystering is a mainstay for these islands. Uh, they've had a phenomenal year oystering so far. Hopefully the market will hold up for them. But um, I've spent quite a bit of time out on the water oystering with them in the winter. Oystering on Smith Island starts in October when the watermen are patent tonging. And in November, switches over to dredging. And in December, Tangier Island opens up for oystering. Um, back in the late 90s and into the early 2000s, there were very few Tangiermen who oystered. Most of them actually crab dredged. And what they were doing is they were catching the crabs that were burying in the, in the bottom uh, for the winter uh, by dredging them. And in 2007, I believe, 
the state of Virginia banned crab dredging. So a lot of TNG men then had to switch over to oystering. This is a photograph of two of the oldest watermen on, on Tangier Island, um, Leon McMahon on the right and Ed Parks on the left. And Ed was 83 and Leon was 87 at the time that I took this picture in 2018. So no retirement for these watermen. They just work until they can't work anymore. And I don't think they would have it any other way. So once the oysters are caught on Tangier Island by the dredgers, they're brought to the by boat. And the by boat uh, to me represents a piece of living history for, for Tangier Island. Um, Jerry Pruitt's by boat, the Delvin K, which you see here, the uh, work boats are tied abreast to her. She's the last working by boat on the Chesapeake Bay that's actually buying oysters on the water. These by boats, if you, if you grew up on the bay, um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, you would have seen them outside of Annapolis buying oysters. You would have seen them out of Rock Hall. They were everywhere on the bay. Anywhere that there were oysters being caught, you would see buy boats. But now Tangier Island is the only place where the buy boat isn't obsolete. So the reason why the buy boat can still function on these islands is because, you know, the boat, the buy boat will buy all the oysters from the dredgers take it to the market as opposed to all the oystermen having to take their own oysters to market. So the oystermen will sell to Jerry Pruitt who runs the buy boat and then he'll make approximately $4 per bushel for carrying the oysters. So if the oystering's good and all the watermen are catching their limits, uh, Jerry's boat can hold approximately 400 bushels of live oysters. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a sight to see when he's got her loaded down. So moving on into winter, um, one of the more exciting and unique opportunities that I had while working on this book was to go out to Tangier Island during a freeze up. And um, I wasn't able to get there by boat, obviously, because the bay was frozen over. But I was able to uh, charter a Cessna out of Chrisfield to fly me over. Yes, Chrisfield has an airport, in case you're wondering. So I flew from Chrisfield over to Tangier, took about 10 minutes, um, and then landed on the island and stayed out for about a week and a half. So I got to spend a week and a half with the Islanders in complete isolation. I was the only non-Islander there and captured some amazing images from my book. This is a photograph of the icebreaker that the state of Maryland sent out. And you can see the boat, the barge behind the icebreaker. That's the uh, fuel barge that um, or the barge that was used to push the uh, the fuel the load of fuel and he's being escorted away from Tangier Island through the ice. Black Hawk helicopters were brought out by the um, Army National Guard to bring food to Tangier. This was after being stuck out there for about five days. So you can see the Cool Whip, frozen uh, orange juice. Um, Hungry Man and all the other essentials were brought out to the island at that time. But they did, uh, the Army National Guard brought, um, brought four helicopters out um, throughout the course of that day. And then also I got to photograph the Coast Guard bringing supplies out to the island. So this was really a unique, unique opportunity to be out on the island and you know truly see what it was like to be cut off from the mainland. You know, the, the, the ferries that normally run on a daily, ba twice daily basis, actually weren't even going out. So you got to see what it was like to be fully cut off. This is a photograph of a young waterman, um, Trent Pruitt on Tangier Island. And he's uh, riding his bicycle around on the ice around the number seven day marker coming into the island from the Eastern side. The Islanders brought back a tradition of having a bonfire on the ice. And the last time that this happened was during the freeze up of 1977. So for me, I was, I was completely thrilled that I was able to be there during this time. And it, it, was, it was really pretty enjoyable. We burned an old crab house and burned an old skiff on the ice. So moving on to kind of the islands of the past. And um, 
going to talk a little bit about the islands that were formerly inhabited and then also parts of Smith Island in Tangier that had inhabitants but now don't. So this is a, a photograph of Drum Point Island. This was taken in 2018 in the summer um, when very little was left to Drum Point Island. At one point in time, Drum Point Island had a couple homes, a store. It was never a big development on the island, but you know there were people living there and it's all but washed away. Um, in 2020, I went back and there's really nothing left of Drum Point Island. So that's a similar fate for other islands on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is a photograph of James Island at the mouth of the Choptank River. And James Island, at one point in time, was inhabited. And just like Holland Island, which I mentioned earlier, had you know, multiple homesteads, had a school, um, stores, etc. And this is James Island in 2019. As you can see, there's very little left of it. And so some of the other islands that I'll include in the book that aren't, aren't pictured right now are Watts Island, uh, Barron Island. Barron Island is up near Hoopers. Watts is down um, southeast of Tangier. Uh, Lower Hoopers Island had a community on it. And another island that I'm highlighting is Sharps Island. And Sharps Island is one of the islands that's completely disappeared. Um, Sharps Island is at the mouth of the chop tank. And uh, at one point in time, Sharps Island was about 600 acres. I think the land survey that was done in the late 1600s indicated that it was approximately 630 acres. And now it's just completely underwater. So this lighthouse sits on top of what Sharps Island was. I'm sure many of you have seen that lighthouse. Oh. Excellent. I think we're gonna open it up to questions now. Any questions about the presentation, questions about Smith Island, Tangier, or the Chesapeake Bay? Um, you can put your questions in the chat portion of the page. Great. Uh, thank you, Jay, so very much. And uh, we, uh, as you said, uh, we are look, like to have folks put in questions. So you can find your how to open the chat uh, section at the very end. And uh, wanted to be sure that uh, you all can see where to go. It's right at the very bottom of your screen, okay? And it's called chat. So right, type in your questions and we'll direct the questions to uh, Jay. Uh, the one thing that I did wanna just, first off the bat, Jay, there's a couple questions that came in while you were talking. <laughs> um, one was from Peggy Donald, who had an immediate question when uh, she saw the tabernacle and a big banner that said 2020. How mm -hmm. has COVID affected the uh, Islanders? What's going on out there? So initially with the um, shutdowns, the, f the first thing that got impacted due to COVID was um, the oyster market. Pretty much all the oystermen on Smith Island and Tangier were basically laid off by the oyster buyers because the oyster buyers, they, there was so much uncertainty with the market, they didn't want to invest more into buying oysters. So initially they lost quite a bit of income uh, from the oyster season essentially being cut off by about two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a little bit of a lull in tourism just because it was the, you know, the early spring. Not many people really go out there in March and April. But believe it or not, tourism was incredibly strong this year for the Smith Islanders and Tangier Islanders. And, and I had mixed feelings about, about bringing people out there. So what I did was I canceled my photography workshops that I host out there on an annual basis. This would have been the sixth year that I would have done the workshops out there. So I canceled the workshops in an effort to not bring people out there and not possibly expose people to COVID, you know, not knowingly, obviously. But um, yeah, the, really the tourism industry, I thought would have been really hurt, but there were more people coming out to the islands and renting places 
like through Airbnb or VRBO. So it was, it was a good year for economically for the islands for tourism. Um, and they were very fortunate that during, you know, the spring and the summer that they had no cases of COVID, but now is kind of a different story. Um, there's a, uh, there's currently a COVID outbreak on Tangier, which is, is really alarming. So there's about 19 confirmed cases as of now. So it, COVID, you know, people kind of had their guard down out on the islands because of the isolation and they kind of, they didn't think that COVID could make it out to their communities, but you know, now they're realizing that, that COVID can make it out anywhere and no, nobody's really protected from it. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a scary time for the island and I'm, I'm truly worried that, you know, what might happen with the COVID, but we'll just have to wait and see. So there, nine, you said 19 confirmed cases and uh, that was, of course, on Ch Tangier. At, po the population of Tangier is what approximately? It's between 350 and 400. Um, mm -hmm. Don't have an approximate number or exact number, but it's, it's 350 to 400. We've had a couple of questions regarding what are the biggest differences that you see between Smith Island and Tangier? Well, the, the biggest difference is the, the population, um, the number of people who live on the islands. Um, Smith Island um, in the 1960s had a population of, of about 800, and now the population is around 100 and I think 90 maybe. So the population on Smith Island has severely shrunk. and Smith Island had an older population in the 1990s, and they really saw it like a, a generation of islanders die off. So what's left is a you know, group of people that are primarily older. There's only a handful of young kids. Like I said in the presentation, the population at the Smith Island School, which is the kindergarten through seventh grade school, is five. Um, and that was seven last year, but people, you know, people are moving off the islands. People, um, you know, aren't staying on the islands anymore because it's, it's difficult to make a living. It, you know, there's not many kids around for, you know, your children to interact with, so on and so forth. Um, whereas on Tangier, um, there's a much younger population. So Tangier is kind of behind Smith Island in terms of like the you know, the change in the population. So Tangier Combined School has about 50 kids in it. So you'll see a lot of young kids on Tangier, um, you know, anywhere from, you know, elementary school all the way up to high school. So there's, there's quite a few more kids on Tangier. Uh, it's a lot younger of a population, um, you know, in terms of the differences of like, if you were a visitor going to, going to see the islands um, on, on Smith Island, you'd see very few kids out and about, whereas on Tangier, you'd see kids, you know, playing in the streets, you know, playing out on their bicycles or in their kayaks, little boats, that type of thing. So they're, they're two very different places, although they're very close to each other. Um, Smith Island, ha like I said, has three separate villages on it. And there's a lot more land like around Smith Island, a lot more marsh. So the Smith Islanders are more spread out and Tangier is uh, it's more like condensed um, with 370 or so people living on a, uh, you know, a couple like high ridges in the marsh. You know, you're, you're kind of on top of your neighbors and you see a lot of people, you know, a lot of the same people all the time. And, you know, the streets are very busy and golf carts and Kawasaki mules up and down the street all the time. It's, they're, they're both, they're both incredibly unique, and um, you know, I would I would truly recommend visiting both islands once this whole mess is over. <laughs> well, one of the uh, questions, actually, talking about visiting uh, the islands, uh, one of the questions from Amy Clements and Dan uh, is that they were wondering how to get over to Smith and Tangier Island if you don't have a boat and uh, don't want to rent a plane. <laughs> So, so the best way to get to the islands, um, 
And I would highly recommend going in the spring or the summer. And the fall is very nice too. Um, I personally like the spring. But uh, the best way to get to the islands is by taking the ferries from Crisfield. So the ferries leave um, Crisfield um, at 12.30 every day. And there's three boats that go to Smith Island and one boat that goes to Tangier. So the ferries um, are essentially like the mail boats and the supply boats. So you can hop on and I think, um, I think it's $20 one way to go to both Smith or Tangier. I typically take my own boat, but um, you know, you can take a day trip out there or, you know, rent a place to stay overnight. Um, I think, I, I don't think doing a day trip um, really does justice to being out there. Cause I, I love being out there, you know, as a photographer, obviously taking advantage of the natural light um, at you know, the best light at sunset and getting up early in the morning is very nice too. Yeah. We have uh, several more questions coming up here and I'm, I'm getting them on my phone as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other cool question uh, that uh, Alvia Thompson had is how is the closing of the Smithsonian Center that's on the islands affecting the islanders and are they still denying that climate change is affecting them? So I'm I'm not aware of the Smithsonian Center on the islands. Um, Tangier has a museum um, that's still open but not on a regular basis. Um, Smith Island also has a museum. Uh, and Smith Island has the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Education Center in Tylerton. And due to COVID this year, uh, CBF wasn't bringing any groups of kids or they, they also bring over teachers. They do like, uh, you know, teacher retreats during the summers. Um, but that, that did have a negative impact on tourism because the Chesapeake Bay Foundation does bring a bit of tourism to uh, Tylerton. Um, and the second question about denying climate change, um, you know, that's a, that's a touch, touchy subject with the Islanders. Um, a lot of them, you know, they believe in what they see. And, you know, when you think about the world that they live in, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, kind of a bubble, so to speak. It's a very small, small world. And um, the Tangier Islanders and Smith Islanders truly believe that erosion is affecting the um, sustainability of their islands more than um, climate change necessarily. Whether or not the erosion is accelerated by climate change, that's another debate. But, um, you know, the islanders, they believe in what they see from their experiences. And when you can go to a place like Upwards on Tangier and see your family's headstones and graves washing into the water, you know, that's what you're going to believe. You're going to believe in erosion. And, um, you know, to an extent, I, I do agree with them, um, especially with Tangier, that erosion um, is a much more pressing issue than climate change because Tangier has such such a small landmass that's actually left as a buffer to protect that community um, that, you know, erosion will eat the island away before climate change or sea level rise ever does. Well, I do know in your, um, you mentioned you the book uh, Chesapeake Requiem, and I had the opportunity to read it uh, recently. And I do know that uh, it he seems like the denial, though, of uh, sea level rise um, is there, and clearly sea level is rising as well. And I just was wondering if there were any believers that you met at all that believed that sea level was rising, or were they all denying sea level rise itself? I, you know, I have heard some people on the island. Uh, multiple people say that the high tides are more frequent than they have been. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple spots, obviously low spots on the islands where you get, you know, regular tidal flooding, they call it nuisance flooding. Um, in particular, the road between Yule and Rhodes Point on Smith Island, um, that seems to be underwater at least a couple times a year. So I don't think there's any denying that the fact that the tides are you know, the high tides are more frequent. Um, there are a lot of variables that affect the high tides, such as wind. Um, you know, if you not notice on the water here, even in Annapolis, if you get a, like a strong northeast wind for like three or four days, that'll push water into the bay. If you get a northwest wind, it'll push water out of the bay. 
so there's a lot of variables that affect the um, you know the the rising water phenomenon but I do think there's some truth also to the islands subsiding um, you know when you think about the the ground on the islands it's very saturated you know in areas where there's a lot of weight on the ground such as you know these towns um, you know the the land is definitely settling and you can notice it in some spots um, you know and uh, another problem too is if you get a high tide on the islands um, the water will come up but then it's got nowhere to go out once it comes up you know the tide will fall and then you you're left with these puddles that will of salt water that'll kill the vegetation and you know just super saturate the ground and i think yeah, that's that's a big problem for the islanders you know what what the islanders really need is as simple as dirt they need dirt to build up their land to prevent you know the tidal regular tidal flooding and they need rocks around the island to protect them that's really truly what's what's going to protect the islands the most we had a, another question here uh, with regard to the um, graduate, the one and only graduate <laughs> of, the of the high school. What does he want to be? And uh, does he have any plans for the future? So that's a great question because it can it will allow me to talk about something that the Tangier Islanders and Smith Islanders um, have done quite a bit in the last probably 25 years, and that's um, tugboating. Um, quite a few of the Tangier Islanders and Smith Islanders um, work on tugboats. They work for like, companies like Bain Brothers, Express, um, Dan's Towing, companies like that. And, um, you know, the tugboating where the Islanders are on the water, you know, they have a lot of experience and skills on the water. And, you know, they're kind of used to being away from home when they're oystering or, you know, crabbing away from home. And, um, it's kind of a natural transition and, and what the tugboating provides for the islanders is a stable income um provides them with health benefits unlike working on the water you know there's a lot less variable in terms of you know you're not at the mercy of regulations changing um that'll affect the viability of your income so a lot of the islanders have gone to that and matthew parks the graduate um from tangier combined he's planning on going to tugboating. So he's, he's, he's working with his father right now, uh, crabbing and oystering, but um, his goal is to go tugboating with uh, Bain Brothers. It's a company out of Baltimore that moves fuel up and down the coast. Um, we have a, an, another question, uh, just uh, more on the aspect of the community here. Is there still general store open on Tylerton? Yes, there, there is a general store open in Tylerton. It's called Drum Point Market. Um, when I lived in Tylerton for uh, three months this fall, I was down there September, October, and part of November. Um, I did all my shopping at the Tylerton General Store. Um, they had everything that you needed? They've really got everything you need. And uh, there are many places where you can go catch fish and they'll cook it for you. <laughs> so <laughs> it's... Uh, it, the Drum Point Market is an incredible place. You know, you can you can be sitting there eating a crab cake and, you know, in could walk the waterman who caught the crabs. I mean, there's really not many places where you can have that similar experience. It's um it's it's a step back in time for sure. Uh, we also just had a curiosity, uh, any recommendations for your favorite place to eat? Well, I mean, you get a good market. meal. Drum Point Market is a great place to eat um, in terms of a spot to just walk into. Um, Lorraine's on Tangier is a good place, but really the best meals that you could po ever possibly have on these islands are in the homes of Islanders. Or, you know, if you, if you were down there, say like renting an Airbnb for a weekend, you know, there's some Islanders who will cater to tourists and who will, uh, they'll cook for, they'll cook for groups of people. So that's truly the, the best dining experience on the island is uh, is when you can get these these ladies from the island to, to cook for you. That home cooking is the best. The, the best cook, the best cook on Smith Island, in my opinion. I might get in trouble for saying this, but that's okay. Is a lady named Hester Smith, and um, she uh, she cooked at this hunting club that was up on South Marsh Island. 
years ago. She's in her 80s now and still going strong. But um, she cooked for men at this hunting club for a whole life. And um, she had two boys. She cooked for them for her for their whole lives. And uh, her grandson, she cooks for them. And I always try to get a try to get a meal in with Hester. I'll, I'll bring her some fish or bring her some uh, bring her some oysters or whatever. And, and I'll always try to sneak a meal into her house, try to weasel my way into a family meal. Always a fun experience. Sounds like a good, good deal there. Yeah. Another question, a couple more questions. With all of the new uh, construction um, and communications, why don't they move the, it, to the islands um, on the Eastern shore, uh, for, as they do on the Eastern shore, for example? With, with, new communi with construction of new com uh, communication systems, why don't they move it uh, to the islands? I mean, it seems like the islands are a little bit is are isolated and also. Yeah, so uh, the, the internet and, and communications has, like modern communication has made, you know, doing business on the islands differently. And like I mentioned in my presentation, you know, this one woman, Marietta Marshall, she you know, she was shipping cakes to California that she had made. So, you know, the internet has opened up a whole new market for the Islanders and also think about the, the homes that they're renting out, um, you know, on Airbnb and VRBO, you know, they're able to reach a, you know, a, a real broad audience, so to speak, um, through the internet. Um, so they're getting there, but. Uh... Yeah, they're getting there, but I mean, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these islanders are kind of, you know, it's an older population and a lot of them are resistant to, to change and to doing new things. And, you know, most of the men on the island, they've worked their entire lives on the water. And, you know, a lot of them have done pretty well and they really don't need a whole lot of money out there to live. So, you know, a lot of them really don't have the desire to get into, you know, to, to try to capitalize on you know, the, the internet and tourism and stuff like that. They just, you know, it's just, they're just content where they are. Yeah. Well, we have also another question here. Is there any racial diversity on the islands? Solid. Not really. No. There's uh there's one waterman on Tangier who's, um, he's, uh, his father was from the Philippines and his mother was from Tangier. And that's, about it that's about it there's uh on smith island there's a um there's a a pretty sizable gay community which um it's an interesting story there um a realtor on the island who since passed was advertising the smith island community as being a gay friendly community which at the time it wasn't you know as i mentioned in the presentation they're very religious so when a lot of gay couples started moving to the island. Um, it was difficult for the islanders to accept, but it's become, it's become accepted. And, um, you know, they're, they're just part of the community on Smith Island. They, you know, they participate in, you know, community events. And there's a guy who does like boat repair and mechanical work. So, you know, there, there is a little bit of diversity on the islands, but um, in terms of racial diversity, there's really not much. I mean, most of the most of the people on the island are of English descent and you know came from a handful of families that originally settled on the islands well it, it sounds like uh, it takes a while for things to change in the, on the islands and that's part of their their charm <laughs> as well as uh, the challenge yeah, um, you, I just uh, we've had to, uh, we have to wrap up here it's pretty soon, but I know we've, uh, they've had several comments, and I've received several uh, texts. Uh, 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 well, Allison Keene, for example, had the uh, point. She said, "Thank you so very much. It was an amaz amazing photography, and thank you." And uh, no similar texts uh, from several people. So we really very much appreciate your presentation today. Would you like me to show the uh, the the promo code that I'm offering to the EYC members? That would be fantastic. I know I'm going to be going online right after this uh, presentation and signing up for my calendars. <laughs> so, um, so if you could put that up on the screen, that would be great. 
Absolutely. So what I'm doing for EYC members as part of my holiday event is that I'm offering 15% off for um, all online orders. And um, if you go to my website, which is jflemingphotography.com backslash shop, you can um, view all the different prints. Um, I have a 2021 calendar, which I only have about um, 30 copies left. And I have work in the water, signed copies of that and both frame and unframed prints. So if, if you go on there and if you'd like to purchase anything, you're welcome to 15% off through your EYC membership. And how long is that good for, Jay? So this promo code will be good through December 10th. Okay, great. Well, thank you so very, very much. And uh, I know uh, we uh, do have, uh, oh gosh, gosh, we still have more questions all still coming in, but uh, everyone awesome. is really looking forward. <laughs> And uh, everyone is very, very much looking forward to uh, obviously having a chance to look, see your new book and also to checking out the website. So thank you again. We'll uh, close out here. It's uh, just coming on eight o'clock, but I do want to just let you know there is a, a slew of saying great presentations and thank you so much and uh, coming from several different sources. So we thank you again for joining us for this evening. And I know it's really brought a little bit of Christmas cheer for me just to have a really exciting and valuable uh, presentation because I know all of us are worried and concerned about our islands. Absolutely. And I think it'll be just, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a wonderful way to go do a little bit of my Christmas shopping as well. So thank you very, very much for uh, offering that discount to our EYC members. And let's, I know you can't hear it, but I I'm going to give an applause, and I know you'll see some other folks uh, joining in uh, these vis uh, visually so much, but I can assure you that all of us very much appreciate your time this evening, and thank you again, and thank you all for joining us for our EYC Environmental Committee's holiday presentation. And uh, John or Nancy, uh, do you want to add anything? I think they're... Just to say congratulations, John. You want to just delete? We and all of us are just really have enjoyed the presentation. And uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for coordinating our the efforts tonight to get uh, Jay here. <laughs> you were good, did a good job arm twisting, right, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. And he did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And thank I you, really John. Appreciate you, you all bringing back and. And hopefully when my new book comes out in October of next year, hopefully I can get to see you all in person and present the new book. Oh, great. Well, Jay, if you ever want to do any cold water diving photography, you're always welcome to uh, photograph our uh, oyster reef in the Eastport Yaku docks. Oh, that'd be cool. Oh, yeah. good idea, John. <laughs> we have a really cool oyster reef. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the best time to photograph stuff underwater in Chesapeake Bay is when it's cold. So I've got to right. suit up for that. But yeah, that's, that, that'd be neat. Extreme low tide, the end of February, early March. Yeah. Is it, how deep of water is it? Oh, the deepest, I mean, the bottom is um, nine feet. But the first, shell, so we have these uh, shelves as a kind of a breakwater for our marina. They, they're mm -hmm. not solid um, wall it's just shelves and we have seated concrete triangles on them they're going oysters and the most shallow uh, oysters are probably just below the surface when you get an extreme low and then they go on down to um, you know nine feet but at ex again extreme lows you probably the, the total depth is closer to six I don't know maybe seven yeah that's about that's about perfect yeah Occasionally in the Severn River in the spring and the fall, we can get pretty clear water. I've, I've got a video, I'll, I'll send it to Virginia and she can, she can send it out to the group. But uh, last year I did quite a bit of diving on the upper Severn River. There was a, there was an unusual abundance of underwater grasses and that resulted in very clear water. Um, so I, I was able to do a bunch of diving in like towards the end of June and in July. And that was, that was pretty remarkable. So yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of healthy aspects of the bay that are still hanging around in, in this area. It's good to see. That'd be great. Great photography. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you all. Yeah, I appreciate it. Great. So thank you. And we'll, we'll close out now. And uh, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful, happy holiday. And thank stay you all. safe <laughs> and healthy. <laughs> COVID free. <laughs> Take care. Good night yeah. all. And thank you again, Jay. No problem. Thank you, Virginia.